All right. Hello. Today I'm talking with Matt Goldman, the CEO of Churnbuster. Hi, Matt. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. You are welcome. I'm really excited about this. Uh, so this, I think, is going to be really interesting on two fronts. One, you run a SaaS-based app. And two, that SaaS app is designed and its whole purpose is to help other recurring revenue situations uh, grow and avoid churn, mitigate churn, that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot of layers to this conversation. Uh, I guess, can you give a quick intro rundown to kind of your career trajectory and what led you to Churnbuster? Yeah, so um, I don't even know how long ago it was now. Forgive me for any slow <laughs> thinking. I have a three-week-old at home and my brain doesn't work. Um, a few years ago, we started a Stripe Analytics product called Hookfeed, my wife, Joelle, and I, and ran that for a couple of years. And at the same time, we were running a podcast called Rocket Ship FM. And at some point along the way, we interviewed a guy named J.D. Grafham, who ultimately bought Sifter from yep. you. Um and he told us about his process for buying SaaS apps, and we really liked it. And it got us thinking about what we could buy to get past the problem that we were having with Hookfeed, which was product market fit. Um, so could we find something with some fit that we could then focus on growing, which we thought was you know, going to be the easy part for us. But you learn that there's always other challenges. Um, so we had gotten to know Andrew Culver, who started Churnbuster a few years before, and after a few months of exploring the idea of selling it, uh, we ended up pulling it off. He was a CTO at another company, so this was a side project for him, and and he was a bit um, you know, burnt out running both things at the same time. So we found a way to keep him involved as a, a partial owner and uh, add on a teammate, Ken Johnson, who worked on Manpacks before, and uh, yeah, we took it over. Right on. So I guess, uh, so how long have you been working on it now? About a year and a half? It's been about a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit, I guess, about the acquisition process in a little more detail. Like what really kind of instigated, it sounds kind of, you know, it was maybe we can avoid this whole growth thing and just fast forward a little bit. Um, what was kind of the sequence of events? Had y'all known each other through other things um, beyond that or... What was kind of the, the the details there? Yeah, so we met Andrew at a uh, at microconf conference, okay, and then a handful of people from that started a Slack chat where we would hang okay, out, yeah, and, you know, share ideas. So we just got to know him over time in there, and at one point we threw out the idea after seeing him talk about maybe selling it. Uh, we threw out the idea that we would be potential buyers and we didn't know at that point how we would raise the money or or what the deal would actually look like but we just wanted to be considered in case he ever did make the final decision so after that we went quiet for a few months and then he got more serious and we were there to to negotiate so um at that point we followed jd's process pretty tightly which is as you know it's you know light on legal fees and yeah. and uh, timeline and uh, and pretty quick. So, did due diligence, looks at looked at metrics and code, and made sure everything looked like it would be a good fit. And since we had worked in the Stripe ecosystem before, and we uh, we had worked on Ruby and Heroku apps, it was just a perfect fit all around. So, something that after the code looked good, we were able to drop in and start running it from day one without much much coaching from him. Yeah. So, kind of just a, the back channel was ongoing and knew yep. each other and that made it a whole lot easier because there's a level of trust there that and with us it. not having any experience buying someone else's product um and working in their code base we wanted to make sure that we kept him around uh, beyond just a 30 or 60 day support window we wanted to make sure that he you know really had a shared interest in the project doing well and would want to be around to answer a question if a year later something came up that we missed or a client wanted to have a conversation with him like we want to make sure that he was still excited about the project i think i missed the boat i kind of have been doing that for jd and sifter <laughs> just for <laughs> free i should have yeah <laughs> i should have worked that in um yeah. so I guess, so the logistics requiring it were obviously really simple and straightforward because you knew each other um, and had that kind of mutual trust. So it wasn't this long drawn out, complicated uh, situation with a crazy extensive consulting agreement. It sounds like it wasn't just a, a straightforward, 
all cash deal simplicity, but uh, it still was fairly, there, there wasn't this long letter of interest due diligence process. Yeah. No, if if anyone listening knows Andrew, they know that he's like the nicest guy in the world, and he would never do anything to to harm a friend. Um, so we knew that going into it, and he he thought highly of us as well, and um, everything was very very straightforward. So looking back, is there anything that really kind of caught you off guard, or that you didn't expect with the sales process that it would have been better to know going into it, or you could have prepared for better, timing wise, schedule wise, anything like that? Uh, well, you, you told us a long time ago to not put life on hold, <laughs> <laughs> and we followed that pretty well. So at the time, we were, uh, I think we were in due diligence when we were at our wedding. Oh wow! And okay. then. In the year following, we did a house remodel, we got pregnant, we uh, had other projects going on, and it was endless things the first year. So that definitely uh, distracted us starting all the way back to the actual acquisition process. And then I know that we ran into a lot of problems and learnings in the year and a half following, um, but the actual sale process was pretty straightforward. Okay. So no curveballs or things that uh, yeah. you wish you had known. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that first year. I know you've mentioned it has it was kind of painful, a lot of learning curve. It wasn't the uh, hit fast forward and just sit back and grow. Uh, yeah. that I think y'all probably hoped for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So the first, I think the first problem that we ran into was that we raised money to take over the product, to buy it from Andrew, but we didn't raise money to fund some growth in the first year. So uh, starting that first month, we had a zero bank balance and money would come in and it would go right back out. Yeah. So for the first six to nine months, we were struggling with cash flow, which isn't a common, or maybe it's more common than I think, but it seems like with SaaS, it's not like working in an agency where you're constantly yeah. focused on cash flow. For us, um, he launched the product in the last few days of uh, the month. So all of our original clients who were still customers would pay in the last few days of the month. So our expenses wouldn't line up with those. And it was, it was a pain in the butt. So yeah. that would have made it a little bit smoother in the first year. After that, I think that, um, and this is a direct result of that, not being able to fund a tech lead for the project meant that I was the tech lead. So every customer conversation, every, um, code question, every script that we had to run in different scenarios. There were a lot of manual processes within Churnbuster and all that was in my head. And there was never a really good time during that first year to be able to delegate that to someone else, especially since our dev help was at very low hours, less than part time. Yeah. So until very recently, we didn't have someone where we would really hand off everything to and have them be the lead, especially because a lot of the manual scripts that needed running had to be done in response to a customer request. So if they weren't going to be working for a few days, then it would have just fallen back on my plate. Yeah. So by not being able to fund a little bit of a team around it, all that fell onto my plate and also onto my partner, Ken's plate, who was leading sales. So between manual onboarding, um, manual upgrades of accounts, and every support request becoming an escalatable request, we were just making 100 micro decisions a day. Yeah. And in that first year, we couldn't identify the actual cause, but we just knew that we weren't getting work done and we weren't being as efficient and productive as we were on past projects. Yeah. We just felt stuck. So kind of, kind of forced to tread water and catch up and the whole time too. I mean, yeah. you're not totally solo when, you know, you've got some experience uh, with Andrew, but, uh, you're kind of learning the whole business, you, you know, even though it's similar, um, to your past experience, you're basically learning the whole business, the ins and outs, yeah. all the little subtleties through all of this at the same time. Yeah. And I think something else that we screwed up really starting day one was we came in and we assumed that there wasn't a reason why he was doing the things that he was doing. And we took our ideas and rolled with them from brand new pricing to taking self-serve onboarding and making it manual onboarding. Mm -hmm. we, we changed a lot of major aspects of the business on day one. Real quick, yeah. And we churned, we had a huge first two months and we churned out almost everybody. 
oh, wow. just because expectations were off. Like it, yeah. we had no clue what we were doing in this new business. And a lot of ideas seemed like a good idea on the surface and it would show until three or six months later yeah. that it wasn't working. Yeah. So if we, and this is one of the bits of advice from JD that we didn't follow is when he takes something over, he's looking for something that will run for six to 12 months flat and he's yeah. not worried about growth. He's doing it on debt and he wants to service his loan yep. before he takes any risks. So uh, in the first year, he doesn't change anything. Yeah. If it's working, he leaves it. And we came in and, and thought we were brilliant. So <laughs> if we were going to do it again, we would have mo moved much slower. We would have focused on shipping features rather than working on performance and bugs behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, That's interesting because so many people, I think uh, it's so tempting to think, okay, I just got this. Now I'm going to go, you know, hit the gas and really make it accelerate and grow when, and you know, and we all, everybody's habit, everybody's temptation yeah. is I want to grow faster. I want to move faster. I want to ship faster when... In reality, it sounds like it may have been healthier to just slow down, take yeah. a step back, focus on some fundamental things, play it safe, learn, and then choose your battles after that. Talk to customers. Talk to customers. You know, if you have time. Yeah. Um, so then, in hindsight, it sounds like raise a little bit more money to cover some technical help and or find some way to facilitate that so there's less of a burden. Yeah. Um and then spend, you know, give yourself a little time, spend it talking to customers, doing research, getting yourself familiar with the existing code platform, the problems, you know, spending two or three months doing that, and then make a much more informed decision about the areas you attack and how you attack. Yeah. Yeah. I think something that applies in this as well as non-acquisition is, I think a lot of companies rely on scripts. Did you have a lot of manual stuff behind the scenes at Sifter? A, a good amount. I was pretty good about automating stuff in an, in an admin tool that I had built. Um, yeah. But yeah, there was definitely a lot of things that in hindsight, it's a whole chapter in the book now is you can yeah. automate more. I, I think I even have written it up on uh, Medium already that I wish I had automated more um, and really thought about the value of automation, not just in terms of, well, it'll save me 30 seconds, but it only takes me 10 seconds to do it. I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm, it's not worth it. You know, yeah, it's, it's worth a lot more than, than we think it is doing simple time math. And it took us a long time to, to actually commit to doing that. And it wasn't until the past few months when we did. And for us, it helped to look at it as a spectrum from having a you know manual code that you run 50 lines of code that you paste into terminal yep. to making a class that, you know, makes it a one liner to um, delegating it to somebody else and documenting how it works and, and what it does, and then to automating it and turning yeah. it into a button yep. uh, or something that just runs. And it's it's funny. I think that's that was a big part of the problem, at least in my head, was it was black and white. It was either it's automated or it's not. Yeah. And in reality, there's a whole progression that you can make that helps slowly chip away at it. But you also you kind of want to do it as manually as possible for a while to really, really get familiar with the process. Yeah. And until you've done it 10, 20 times, uh, depending on how complicated it is, you, you know, that learning curve is good for helping you figure out the best way to automate it. So otherwise, if you build the automation right out of the gate, you're probably going to build the wrong thing to automate it or yeah. make a mistake. You're going to have to go back and revisit it. So it's, it's helpful to do automation in a progression rather than just one big fell swoop, automate something. Yeah. And I think the, what compounded that problem was I wasn't, uh, my head was in so many places that I wasn't in a place where I would take those learnings in and then think to go automate it or think of low hanging fruit yeah. opportunities to improve, um, yeah. along a progression. So, um, in my head, it was just, let me jump in here, do this 10-minute task, and move on. But when so many things are backing up, that 10-minute task ends up being a one- or two-hour task because there's so much um, switching costs going yeah. on. Like I, I just Absolutely. can't think when I'm overloaded. So what's been really cool the past couple months is getting that onto our developer Ryan's plate mm -hmm. and seeing him go through the process, seeing him uh, – run into enough frustration to where he finds a path to uh, automate along that progression um, because those were the things that I just wasn't thinking about. I was thinking about how to get this task done. Yeah. So another thing that we talked about briefly was the 
in that first year, you're treading water, trying to catch up, get familiar with everything. Um, and as customers or potential customers, they see a company's just been acquired. They have high hopes. They expect everything to become amazing and start really seeing a lot more investment. Did it play out like that? How did that uh, turn out for y'all? Well, the first few months, we we brought on some really big customers, and then the system ran into some performance problems. And we spent probably nine months to a year trying to fix performance problems the way that they were showing themselves were timeouts in the dashboard. And it was very, very um, prevalent. It was like probably one in five or 10 page loads would be a a timeout error. So we just went through the app week after week, fixing what we thought was causing the problem. And it, it would help a bit, but it never fixed the ultimate uh, problem until we brought in uh, an outside contractor and he identified a script that was running um, i believe it was uh, a fail safe to make sure that our campaigns were getting um, classified the right way for analytics so it would look at the history in each campaign and make sure that the status of it was what it should actually be whether it would be um were covered without a customer updating their card or whether we take credit for it or if the customer was lost. So it was running through every campaign that had ever existed and then looking at every webhook that had come in during that campaign and then running calculations. And it was doing that every hour. And the script itself ran for two hours. And so So, that was running on the same uh, VM as the web server? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay. And it was just... Backing up, it was we we transitioned a lot over to Sidekick when we took over, okay. and this was running on other tech. We just didn't have visibility. Our our new relic and Skylight wasn't showing it. Did you um, did you push that off on a on a separate VM or just switch no, to Sidekick and we did we didn't and, need it at all and fragment it. Okay, we did a, a one or two line code change and it removed the need to to check for that. Okay, so there there were a lot of scripts early on that had been Andrew put him in uh in probably the early weeks of building Turnbuster is like this should work but just in case it doesn't let me just write this script and it worked fine at that stage but once you Scale, bring yeah. in a really massive customer and once it operates for four or five years and you're going through the full history uh, behind the scenes it grows to be Huge. dangerous yeah, yeah so there were there's a lot that first year where we could just and in a lot of cases, just delete it or find a way to to rewrite it to be performant. So that was that, and a few other changes were happening late last year. And it wasn't until then that we, about a year in, that we um, finally started to see performance lift, and it lifted in a big way. And everything else we did that year were minor improvements that <laughs> probably helped, but. Uh, didn't solve the actual problem. So during that whole time, we had a whole team of people and our big claim was that we had a team focused on solving this problem every day, but that wasn't showing to customers because we were doing performance fixes and bug fixes. They weren't seeing big features. We weren't differentiating from competition and we would get people actually writing into us saying, are you there? (laughs) Or going to competitors and telling them that Churnbuster is not even working on the product. Yeah. Uh, like, which is we are we're working so t- hard <laughs> yeah tough from a competitive standpoint and really tough for the team to hear when they're working their butts off every day yeah. um, and ultimately that's that's not a problem with tied to performance it's a problem tied to process where we weren't prioritizing shipping visible features yeah if well, that was our focus from day one it would have happened even when the features aren't visible making a point to share either via newsletter, blog posts, Twitter, keep customers in the loop, keep open lines of communication so that it's clear there's signs of life and it's not just, you know, this business may not be there. One of the uh, yeah. things that I advise, and I'm going to have a whole chapter on vendor evaluation in the book, is for people to go check Twitter feeds and vlogs and look at, you know, things like the footer and be like, does it say you know, copyright 2010, (laughs) then don't necessarily take that as a bad thing, but do some due diligence and make sure that this business isn't just kind of wobbling along on the side. Um, 
And, you know, it definitely, it sends a strong signal when you go to check these sites and people, they're not communicating with customers. They're not saying anything. They've been quiet or yeah. it's, it definitely sends a bad sign. So, and I think it's, it's also, um, a side effect of being distant from customers. Like yeah. we, we're still not com communicating as well as we should with current customers. We do in the sense that most customers come on board with us through a sales conversation and can stays in great touch with them, but we still aren't using intercom very heavily. We aren't, um, you know, doing NPS or understanding what people like, what they don't like. And as a result of that, it limits how well we can speak to them, um, yep. when it's not necessarily a feature announcement. I think the other there's, there's kind of two channels. One, you can't talk to your customers enough. I don't think, um, in hindsight, I didn't enough with Sifter. I felt like yeah. email was enough, but every time I got on with the phone with somebody, it was so much different. Um, so that's one thing. Talk to them more and talk to them in person. Don't just think email is enough. And then um, the other thing is you're talking to the people that chose you. But mm -hmm. if you're not yeah. actively trying to find the people that chose another product, um, that's where a lot of the most interesting lessons are is why didn't you choose our product? And so you can yeah. end up with some selection bias and working on the wrong things. And so it's important. And that's the hard part is how do you find the people that didn't choose you? Um, you know, you and how do through, you go through trials that didn't convert and that kind of thing and reach out to them, yep. offer gift certificates. Uh, but that's a really hard thing to do. And that's something that because it's hard, a lot of people are just like, eh, I'm not going to bother. There's easier things for me to go work on. Yeah. Um, Cause not only do you have to think to do it, you have to find the time to do it. You have follow-ups like, yep. and one of the things that we've struggled with is, uh, looking at things that we should be doing and not just doing them because we should. So, yeah. and that means admitting that we aren't slack and admitting that we have a, a limited team and maybe our Twitter feed does have to take a hit in the short term, or maybe yeah. we can't ship a weekly feature. Um, but you have to step back and decide which things you want to do and, oh, yeah. and which things you should actually be doing. Um, but that's an example of something that I should have been doing from day one. And that I really want to do now that my plate's cleared. Um, but when you're in it and every day you have a list of things that you need to do and then a list comes up from other people that have been escalated to you because you haven't done a good job of delegating, uh, you're just constantly treading water. And that's the kind of high value thing that always takes a back seat. Yeah. So you mentioned now that you've got a newborn and you mentioned that you've taken off three weeks and it truly taken off three weeks. How did you get from treading water to being able to do that? And, and not just you, but both of you taking off the yeah. time. And I'm assuming Joel is taking off even longer than that. Yeah, she'll she'll probably do three months. Um, I'm planning on doing, I was planning on doing four weeks. It'll probably be more like six now because nice. she had a, a C-section and okay. it was a rough, yeah. rough recovery. Um, but leading up to it, we knew that that was something that was going to be important to me. So... Um, I think we're very lucky, the, the ones of us who are rel relatively independent, to be able to take a longer break. And we uh, looked at it as an opportunity to be able to hand some stuff off to the team that we hadn't prioritized in the past. Yeah. So knowing that we had this impending due date uh, really pushed us to get everything I do handed off. So when something would come up during the day, I would write, write it down, and I would write down whether it was delegatable or documentable. And if it was, then I would put it on a separate list to do that. And we just had spreadsheets running of, of probably over 100 different things. And we ended up with a GitHub wiki that was filled with every possible thing that comes onto our plates. Um, and it helped to get everything out of my head, not only in how things are done, but in how things could be improved. So if we would write down a process for something, at the bottom, I would write down why it hasn't been uh, automated yet or yeah. any concerns I have around it. And That's now that future... Good conversation or decision around whether to do that doesn't have to run through me again and I don't have to worry that they're going to build something that will break this thing in this other part of the code base which is a big problem um, with this code base when we took over is that uh, since it's such a complex product it was not uncommon that you would change some code over here and it would break something over there so in automating these scripts that was something that held us back a lot was fear of what could happen so being able to Delegate it, document it, and document how to make it better, uh, as far as I know, and then trust that the team will take that, and if it's a big enough problem that they will automate it. That was something that really got everything out of my head to where 
when it came time to leave, there were almost no issues getting escalated to me anymore. Yeah. And the that's... team understanding that we're actually out of reach um, was a big help. And there's been probably um, five to ten occasions where there'll be a quick question. I can pop in and write a quick answer. Uh, but they've really done a good job of of running with it without us. And something that came up that we didn't expect, Ken had been planning a Japan trip with his sister. And he had thrown out a few different dates long before we um, you know, realized the due date. And then a few weeks leading up to it he was like oh crap i'm gonna be out of town for 10 days pretty much offline about a week after the due date so we just figured out how to work with it he did the same thing on his end we documented customer facing stuff he documented his sales process and there was a 10-day window that we're now past where none of the partners were online yeah. and the team did an awesome job of keeping everything running and for us it helped us realize that how can we go from day after day of stress-filled, never-ending to-do list to doing absolutely nothing and the company running without us. Yeah. And now we're coming back from that and starting to debrief around what does that mean for our roles now and, and how <laughs> defensive do we have to be about this stuff coming back onto our plate um, and what kind of strategy and, and high-level, um, you know, partner-level thinking can we start to do now that we felt like we weren't being effective at the past year. Now we understand why we weren't. Yeah. Well, and I think the really most interesting thing in there is documenting the processes, is documenting the reasons they are or are not a certain way yet. So I haven't had time because of X or this comp this complexity that you don't see makes this more difficult to automate or whatever. Yeah. So that it's not just just the process, but there's context there that helps people make decisions because that's so often we all want to second guess, be like, Oh, well I could just go knock this out. And then you dig into it and you're just reinventing the yeah. wheel and hitting the same wall. Whereas yeah. if you document that wall, uh, that could save the next person time too. So they can know, okay, we can't automate this until we can commit to solving this other problem or, and that's super costly for someone on your team to jump in. Yeah. To waste build time, a better process, then come to you. You're going back and forth saying why it can't be shipped. Now they've worked on something that's not going to ship yeah. and everyone's worse off for it. Yeah. No, that's a really interesting angle on that. It's so simple, but it's huge. And documentation in general is simple. Uh, this isn't new. For the people listening, this isn't new advice. Yeah. I knew that we should have been documenting. I knew that uh, it's smarter to, or that it's wrong to think that I can do this faster than just handing it off to somebody else. And each time we made that decision, we would acknowledge that in our head and then still do it. Um, but it wasn't until we forced ourselves to step away permanently or you know fully for a set amount of time uh, that we forced ourselves to do it. And I would... We didn't think that was possible, any of this, before we stepped away. So I would recommend planning to just, if you have a couple other people at your company, take two or three weeks completely offline. And in the weeks leading up to it, look at every conversation as an indicator of what you would have to do to get someone else ready yep. to handle that without you or punt it while you're gone if it, mm. if it does have to be escalated. Um, and use that as your your motivation to actually document this stuff. Because without that, I, don't, I think we would have continued another year working on the wrong low value projects. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. So start a SaaS app, have a kid and then use the kid as the motivation to yeah. do the things you should have done in the first place. Yeah. It's a good strategy. Um, use your can't children. see how that could be difficult yeah. for anybody. Uh, <laughs> so I've got some more questions about the experience. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about Dunning and just high level Dunning advice for people. Um, I know y'all have written a lot of really interesting things that have kind of gotten me thinking based on, I had to hand build everything for Sifter because hardly anything existed back then. Certainly no, um, Dunning solutions. So you hand built your billing too. I, yeah, I did the whole thing cause yeah. Stripe didn't exist and Braintree barely existed and it was really rough. The I was on their West. old API. And yeah. like we at some point had to migrate from their old API to their new API and all is, yeah, like that's one thing that I do not, I'm like, I really wish I, if I'd waited a couple of years, life would have been a lot better. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, if you could give people some basic Dunning advice, um, separate from just use Turnbuster, um, what, what would you tell them? Like, what are some common mistakes that y'all see when people sign up that they've been doing that you help them fix? So we wrote a post um, 
that we can link to called yep. 11 SAS retention techniques nobody's talking about. Mm -hmm. And that touched on the most common problems. The, the reason why we saw value in this um, and why we wanted to take over Churnbuster was um, we saw a lot of people thinking of this problem as a vanilla uh, fail payment problem. And when a payment fails, you send out some emails and you recover some number of customers and now we have that in place, let's scale. Um, it was handled like a password reset form and yeah. it was something that dev teams built and ticked off a list and then it would stay in place for years to come. Mm -hmm. Um, and we saw competition thinking about it in the same way. They, they would help people build ultimately the same product at that time, um, to send an email in response to a, a fail payment webhook from Stripe or anyone else. Mm -hmm. And what Andrew was doing at the time was he was, um, he had complex funnels in place so that he could control when retries happened and when emails went out so that in the case of uh, a card being successful on the first reattempt, in those kind of cases, you don't want the customer to receive an email because it, it's our opinion that the emails your customers receive should be good marketing emails and not your payments failing when your payment's not actually failing. It mm -hmm. just creates work for everybody. Yeah. Um, so... That was something that he was doing really well with his campaigns, and he just had a lot more customizability built into the product. And what we learned is that 1% improvement in that process when you're at scale adds up to a lot because every customer you win back compounds every month. So one of the, the big learnings we had early on is that if you recover one more 100 a month customer every month, after 12 months, that's not worth $1,200. It's worth $7,800. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that math applied to a company that's over a million ARR, um, it really, really means that a better system yeah. pays off. Yeah. Whether it's um, sending emails at the right time, retrying cards at the right time, making sure that you're responding properly to bounces that happen, um, finding new points of contact when someone leaves a company, which happens every year if you're selling to startups. Yep. So these are the kind of problems that we're trying to solve. And there's certain lower hanging fruit um, things that you can do in your in-house built uh, product to make it work better, which we talked about in that article. One of the best things is to not do pre-dunning, which is when you send out an email that says your card's going to expire. Um, one of the things that Stripe rolled out the past year is called Card Updater. I know Braintree has it and a lot of other, I think Authorize.net even has it now. Um, but that allows Stripe to, in the background, update cards for you. It's turned on for everybody. If you're using Stripe, you can go into your uh, your event log, look at card updates that have a um, a request coming not from the API, but from Automatic. And you'll see address updates, uh, CVC updates, expiration year, month, card number. The only thing it doesn't catch is uh, when either if they're in a certain country where it's not supported or a card brand that's not supported or if someone closes their Costco visa and switches to a silver Amex. Yeah. There's just no way to know. Yep. But if you switch from your um, Costco visa over to uh, Amazon visa, it might, depending on the bank setup, it might know how to, to draw that parallel. And pass that data to Stripe, which then gets passed through to your own billing. Well, and it's so, a nicer thing for customers in general, too, because it's less yeah. burden for them and everybody wins. So in those cases, Stripe Card Updater works for, last time we checked, was over 70% of cards. So when yeah. you're sending out a pre-dunning email to 100 people telling them that their card's going to fail, 70 of those people aren't going to have a card yeah. failure. Yeah. So what happens is with a lot of people's internal systems, it looks like those emails are working because they're getting card updates and people are making a successful payment. But what it ignores is the amount of people who, had you not sent the email, would have done the same. Mm -hmm. So beyond that, um, I think the, the biggest other problem I'll talk about, the rest you can look at the post, is people have a very short window for recovery. And the shortest we've seen is one day. So Stripe has settings where you can yeah. say retry X times over Y days and then ultimately either cancel the subscription or, or leave it as past due. And we've seen people do one retry on day one and then cancel the subscription. And even if you don't have a great performing system, you could be 
capturing 30, 40 percent or so or more Mm -hmm. uh, just with basic retries or a little bit more with basic emails or uh, in-app updates. So have something in place and make it go over as long of a process as you can because people travel, people don't check their inbox. Three-day weekends, right? So if it fails on a Friday night and then Monday Uh, or Tuesday they should get back from a three-day weekend and they're locked out, wait, what's going on? People check internally to see who's actually using the product if it's not them. Um, and in general, I think a lot of the SaaS founders out there, if they have a simple product, they have a very simple understanding of how their customers interact with it. And it's not always the case that the person who signed up for the product is the one using it today or the one who integrated it. And billing issues are complex. So at least give it time. And if you can build a better process, that article will help you or just use Churnbuster. <laughs> Easy enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now I want to wrap up. We're kind of running a little long, but I want to wrap up with some of the uh, painful phases of all this um, with fairly straightforward stuff. Is the, the simplest one is what has been the absolute most difficult single day um, that you've gone through? What happened? Uh, How would you get through the day? That's tough. I can't think of a single day. But I know we've had, I know that during the first year and a half, we had a lot of stressful days where I didn't necessarily feel stressed. And it's not until you come out of it that you realize how you were. It's one of those death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, you'll realize how your body was trying to tell you. And um, it's not until you come out of that that you realize. So I think that we had a persistent stressful experience with churn buster and i think that i think that all three of us at least uh, at the partner level were really frustrated with the day-to-day we weren't working on things that were having an impact we were um you know trying to integrate with companies who couldn't quite integrate with us yet um having long sales processes having customers who we work really hard to please and then they wouldn't have any appreciation for it after several months and Ultimately, all that comes back to us, mm. um, and we have to be able to spot uh, what's needed, whether that's shipping more features or um, whatever else it could be. And what's hard is when you're in that thinking about how to identify the actual problem and solve it. It just feels like a, a shitty, a shitty day. So we had a lot of that, and it took us a while to come fully out of it, identify all the layers, and start to fix each one. And now we're at that for the first time. So uh, it was totally death by a thousand cuts yeah. in terms of, of burnout and stress. Have you, um, has growth been pretty steady? Has there been plateaus that you've hit and had to creatively, creatively break through? Um, if so, kind of what were those plateaus and what was the adjustment that got you through? We're pretty low volume compared to most apps. Yeah. Um, you know, we charge quite a bit more. We do a lot of hands-on sales. So it's really hard to um, track any kind of significant um, growth or churn and the cause of it. But we totally have spikes and lulls and you don't really have big shrinking months with SaaS, but there's definitely times where we'll grow like crazy for a month or two and um, we'll actually get an email from an investor and they'll say, do you think that this will happen next month? If not, why? And it's a good question. And the the answer to it is usually uh, we have no clue. (laughs) We think this thing might have worked. We're trying to find a way to make it more regular, um, but we don't know. Yeah. So it's very, very cyclical and what we're trying to do, what I'm hoping we can do uh, by changing up our roles to be more strategic and try more growth activities is that we can make it more regular and have more irons in the fire because when you're so consumed by the day-to-day, you're not thinking a month or two out and talking to the people that you should. Yeah. Um, what about, so what are some of the reoccurring challenges that uh, you've, you're face or currently facing that you haven't solved that you think you should solve? I mean, it sounds like you might have cleaned up a lot of the, uh, the stuff before the baby. But is there any kind of lingering things that you know is just a struggle but haven't been able to commit the time or wish you had found time to fix it at this point, having it repeat yeah. over and over again? Or I think the biggest challenge we face at this stage is balancing big projects with small projects. 
Yeah. So there's there's certain and we definitely have a tendency towards perfection. Mm-hmm. So we we want to work on something for a long time, make it perfect before anyone sees it. And that's not what we need right now. We need yeah. quick releases, but you have to balance that with the three, six, 12 month projects that no one's going to see coming that are going to potentially have a huge impact on yeah. the business. And we have those running right now and we're trying to balance the two, but it's something we still challenge or still struggle with. We, you know, maybe we'll get two or three weeks of frequent updates out and then we go quiet for a bit. Yeah. And, um, big projects tend to drag on longer than you think any project does. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's still a problem that we will have simple in dashboard updates, which, which aren't complex that haven't shipped for months because other things just take priority and mm-hmm. every 30 minute possible change is really a half or a full day, which takes a lot for that to take precedence over another, uh, you know, yeah. another feature. So <laughs> balancing those two is something I think everyone struggles with, Indeed. especially with a small team. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really difficult. Um, I know we've started doing uh, kind of what Basecamp's been doing, which is six weeks, two weeks cycles yeah. where we try to work on six week things, six week projects, and then have two weeks of like cleanup and miscellaneous bug fixing and that kind of little like that. stuff. Um, yeah. And we're early in it, but so far it's been going well and it's really helped us kind of divide and conquer better. Seems like your guys' updates are picking up quite a bit. And it's cool, yeah. even if it is more spread out, to get an email with boom, boom, boom. Here's all the stuff that's happening at Postmark, even there's, if those are small things. There is a lot going on. It's, I yeah. mean, it's it's almost to the point now where I can't even keep up with everything we're working on. Um, a lot of infrastructure stuff as well, performance, um, growth, but at the same time, user facing stuff that's helpful yeah. and, and all that. So, but yeah, it's it is very difficult to pull that off um, without feeling like you're neglecting other areas, right? Yeah, and it's uh, hard to see companies doing it because you don't see you don't hear about how hard it is yeah so for us we look at postmark my god how are they doing this we have much and bigger why team. can't we do it yeah <laughs> much bigger team is part of it i think yeah, we've yeah. got probably 18 people effectively full-time focused on postmark right now yeah that 18, helps. maybe 16 but so a lot there's a lot of love going into postmark yeah um so if you go back all the way back to the beginning give yourself a heads up about something uh maybe this is just since Churnbuster or even before Churnbuster. Uh, what would that be? And you know, you you know, you'd listen to yourself and take the advice. <laughs> um, it would be to not be tech lead. <laughs> to hire, find that person quicker. Yeah, yeah. However, you find the way to do it, just because it's tough. You don't know what we would have not learned as a result of of the three of us being as involved as we were Mm -hmm. it's because stepping into a new business, especially one with a complex product, that's really important. Our sales cycle isn't simple. Evaluating our customers setups uh, before they transition to us isn't simple and every support request isn't simple. So it's tough to know if we would have been as effective with that uh, without being as involved as we were, but we definitely know that it held us back and then it led to a lot of stress. And it sucked out the, uh, I think the value to some extent of having a qualified team in place to focus on growth. We came in thinking products ready to go. It has fit. Let's grow the thing. But all of our energy went into fixing the problems we were seeing because we were so close to it. Um, and Ken came in with tons of growth experience, um, and hasn't really had a chance to zoom out from the sales process and tackle that, which is also the most fulfilling thing for him. Um, there's a lot that we used to do with hook feed that we haven't been able to focus on. Um, and those tend to be the things that you get the most energy and excitement out of is yeah. working on something that you enjoy and then seeing the results come from it. So that's something that we missed in the, in the short term and that we're going to get back now. But I wonder if our growth would have been different in the first year. Um, had we approached it differently. That being said, we did awesome in the first year and it wasn't until we got to the end of the year and zoomed out and like, Oh, we actually did pretty well. Um, until we realized that, but while you're in it, it feels like you're moving so slow. And that's probably the case no matter, no matter what the case with everything. I know with, uh, my leg, it's felt that way. But when I look backwards 
and see events or when day one pops up a reminder like, Oh, a year ago today. And I put up, I'm like, you're kidding. That was a year ago. Yeah. Like, you know, it definitely, I found that, uh, retrospectives to celebrate wins, uh, is what, and I did, did this recently with wild, but I look back at my, you know, coming up on two years, like, well, I've, I've been here two years and I haven't done anything. And so then I like look back and I'm like, oh, okay, we've done a lot. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's 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 so easy to not give ourselves credit for what we've been doing and accomplishing and the progress. Uh, but there's back usually in, a lot more there if you look back. Yeah. Back in January, we moved into our first office. We'd worked out of co-working spaces before. Yeah. So we went to Costco and we, we bought all the snacks and we got a <laughs> big bottle of tequila and a big bottle of whiskey. And they're still sitting on the shelf unopened. <laughs> and we, we looked up the other day and we're like, have we really not had a celebratable moment in the past like six months? Come on. Yeah. We got to drink this stuff. Yeah. It can feel that way. I think yeah. you got to look back and look at what you can force yourself to spend an hour or two and say, let's just list everything we've accomplished. Yeah. And you know, there's plenty to celebrate. It's just hard to see when you're down in the thick of it. Yeah. Cool. So that's pretty much it. Any parting words of advice or, or wisdom to share with people? No, yeah. we, I think hey, we've, we've covered, covered pretty good pretty ground well. here. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, cool. Thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right.